God of wisdom and compassion, cradle us gently in your care as scripture is read. May your spirit guide our hearing so that we may receive your wisdom and journey humbly with you now and always. Amen. Our scripture reading today is from the gospel, or good news of Jesus Christ, according to Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. Let us listen carefully to Mark's account of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem only days before his death. When Jesus and the disciples were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. And so friends, as we turn to reflect on this word, please pause for prayer with me. Holy One, who claims us as your beloved, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So as we've already said, for centuries it has been the custom of the church to kick off this holy week of sacred Christian remembrance with Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, remembering this carefully crafted procession designed to counter the annual Roman imperial procession happening across town. As a reminder, in Jesus' day, Jerusalem probably had around 40,000 inhabitants, But for a major festival like Passover, hundreds of thousands of Jewish pilgrims would pour into the city. With so many people gathered together, Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea, would at this time each year ride into Jerusalem from his coastal residence in the west. Pilate's procession of Roman cavalry and soldiers proclaimed the power of the empire. It was an act of intimidation, a show of force, to remind all the residents of Judea and all those visitors to Jerusalem that Rome was still in charge. Pilate's parade was coercive, embodying self-serving power. In contrast, on the other side of town, Jesus' counter-procession, of course, had a very different feel and proclaimed a very different sort of power. And Jesus planned it that way. Jesus was meticulous and deliberate. Did you notice that more than half of Mark's account of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem is dedicated to the details of how to get Jesus' ride? Maybe we should call it the donkey procurement scripture. Why? Because Jesus knew what had been written by the prophet Zechariah and planned accordingly. 
hundreds of years before Jesus, during a time when many of the Hebrew people were returning from exile in Babylon, the prophet Zechariah sought to nurture the people in hope by proclaiming that a king would come to Jerusalem, humble and riding on a colt, the fold of a donkey, and this king would banish war from the land. There shall be no more chariots, war horses, or bows. This will be a king of peace, commanding peace to the nations. So to counter Pilate's show of force and threat of violence, Jesus plans a demonstration to call to mind Zechariah's prophecy and proclaim the coming of God's vision of peace. To counter Pilate's parade of coercive self-serving power, Jesus plans a procession to embody God's transformative power to make all things new through love and justice, humility and service, caring and compassion and solidarity with the people, particularly the poor and oppressed. And we know well how the people responded. Year in and year out with some variation of a palm processional and hosannas, we remember how the people greeted Jesus with shouts of, Hosanna, save us, and laid branches and cloaks on the road before him. But here's what we don't remember or consider nearly as often. All those people shouting, Hosanna, undoubtedly had high expectations of what was to come next, and most likely most if not all of those expectations went unfulfilled by the events that followed their shouts of Hosanna, blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. A scholar Michael Liddell writes, even as Jesus intentionally enacts the dramatic proclamation of a peace far more radically peaceful than the Pax Romana, Jesus is welcomed into Jerusalem by a crowd that, while undoubtedly characterized by a host of mixed expectations, is clearly hoping for a decisive change in Jerusalem's political climate. Hosanna, blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. No reader should miss the implication. Ladal writes, David's kingdom was built on bloodshed and military might. This new king, in contrast, enters humbly on a colt that has never before been ridden. I asked our fun and insightful group of Bible study regulars this week what they made of that detail that the colt had never before been ridden. We reflected that perhaps it was meant to show or reiterate that Jesus brings peace and calm to all of creation, even bringing calm to a beast of burden who had no previous experience or training for carrying and conveying people or stuff. Wild animals, after all, are not usually pressed into carrying humans without some training. And as Ladal also points out, maybe that's part of Jesus' point here. This never-ridden cult may have carried Jesus calmly, as we all likely envision. Or maybe the cult was irritated the whole time and actually bucked Jesus around a bit. Either way, the cult clearly wasn't trained and thus was completely unsuitable to lead a charge into military battle. Here the people are crying out for a new kingdom. They are shouting for the, out there longing for a new king whom they expect to rule by military might as David did. And here comes Jesus on a colt, not fit for military battle in any way. Turns out Jesus carefully planned procession was a counterpoint not only to Pilate's procession, but also 
to many of the people's expectations of how Jesus, how the Messiah was and is bringing God's peace and God's kingdom into being. From this moment on, Jesus doesn't do anything you would expect from a conquering king. Almost comically, as we heard in today's reading, according to Mark, after Jesus enters the city on this never-before-ridden cult, he enters the temple and looks around, and that's it. It's already late, reads the text. And so Jesus just goes right back out to the city of Bethany from whence he'd come that morning. Not exactly conquering king behavior. And from there, the surprises to the people simply continue. At no point in the week that follows does Jesus just sweep in and take over power. He certainly comes into increasing conflict with those in power, but that's not because he sees his power. It's because he teaches and demonstrates a whole new way of embodying power through love and service, care and compassion. By week's end, those shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David, surely had to wrestle with so many unfulfilled expectations. And the truth is, we aren't that different, are we? As Liddell writes, consider how often and how consistently throughout church history, Christians have longed and prayed for an apocalyptic inbreaking of God's mighty rule in Jesus Christ to right all wrongs. Or stated more plainly, consider how often we long for God to just come and fix all the mess in an instant. Wouldn't that be grand? And while these hopes, they spring from an understandable and good and faithful desire to see the end of suffering, warfare, abuse, and violence, Jesus' very intentional procession on that first Palm Sunday pushes us again to wrestle with the truth that God brings healing and transformation and renewal and peace not by force, but humbly and gently enthroned on a lowly beast of burden. And so, as difficult as it is, as we enter this week of holy remembrance, I'm reminded again that Truly embracing all that is to come, including the great good news of renewal and new life that lies on the horizon, means that we have to let go of worldly expectations, even many of our own expectations of what should be or how God should do it or what Jesus should do. I shared the following quote with the church board this session this week, and I share it again now for it conveys the importance of letting go so beautifully and succinctly. Anna Bladell writes, we must remember that letting go in some way is almost always a prerequisite for healing and renewal. And someone in our community knows this truth, too. For as I pulled into the parking lot this morning, the message written on our community connection chalkboard out along Vine Street literally had me throwing on the brakes and reversing almost into Vine Street. In fact, to make sure I had read it correctly, sometime between Friday afternoon when the melting snow had washed the chalkboard clean and early this morning. A passing neighbor completed our prompt, I feel renewed when, with this response. Anybody see it? Anybody remember? Laura saw it. I feel renewed when I can set out without expectations. Beloved, people of God, 
as we lean into this week of holy remembrance, let us have the courage to set out without expectations, to let go of expectations, to let go of the way we think God should do things, to let go of all that holds our vision and our spirits captive to what was and what is. Let us let go as needed so that we can truly be open to what God is doing, to the new God, new thing God is doing even now for God's promise, reign of peace, God's gift of new life is at hand. It may not be what we expect. It may not happen as we expect, but quickly it approaches. Humble, riding on a colt, our Redeemer King, a king unlike any other comes to save us. And so letting go of expectations, let us join now in praising him. I invite us to join together in the familiar refrain of this day, all glory, laud, and honor. So you're invited to rise in body or in spirit as we sing together song 196, stanzas 1 and 3.